Okay, everyone, welcome to lecture two of graphical models and advanced inference in graphical models. Um, a couple of announcements before we begin. Uh, the first is that I've posted three readings to our Canvas webpage, which uh, you can get. The first is intro.pdf, which talks a little bit about some of the semantics that we were talking about last time, including some additional discussions and also including a bit about what we're going to talk about today. There's a little bit that we hadn't that we hadn't completed last time. A second uh, chapter, if you will, on undirected graphical models and a little bit about the semantics of undirected graphical models, which I think are important. Uh, it's, a, it's an important read because we'll be using them a lot this quarter, um, probably more so than the other two uh, main model type semantics that we talked about last time, namely Bayesian networks and factor graphs. And then lastly, um, another chapter on uh, inference on trees, which um, might sound very limiting, but in fact corresponds to exact inference on any graphical model. Uh, and it turns out, as we will see, that exact inference in any graphical model implicitly one way or another corresponds to some form of tree-like assumption. And so therefore this chapter is called Trees. Um, that, I think, is the only uh, announcement that I have. Uh, so here we are in lecture two, right there. So let's just uh, start in with the review from last time. Oh, there's a question, yes? Just a quick question about the readings. So, um, I mean, everyone learns differently, but is it your intention that we come to class having read the readings, or do you read afterwards? What, what do you think of the uh, what's your intention? I think that if I post the reading like five minutes before the lecture, then obviously you shouldn't have read the material. Um, I think in general, uh, these are readings that you probably want to read through maybe twice. So um, I think uh, clearly, you know, if you read all the readings and you st understand everything perfectly, then the lectures may seem a little bit redundant, but on the other hand, they might solidify your knowledge. On the other hand, if you've seen the lectures first and the lectures aren't 100% clear, then um, you can do the readings. Now, since the, the lectures are being videotaped, you have the opportunity to see the lecture, do the reading, and see the lecture again. And that would be a fantastic opportunity to maximize the amount of, uh, depending on how you look at it, either learning or exposure to my poor sense of humor. So either way, um, you'll, you'll gain, so, or, or lose. Um, another question, yes? Yeah, uh, the slides were on Canvas, but it the lecture slides are on the main web page. They're yeah, not so on I campus. I, and I, I guess there wasn't a link to the web page on, I couldn't actually find it on the internet. I know you posted it on the slides, but since I couldn't access the slides, I didn't actually know what it was. Oh, I see. Um, Maybe the link on the Canvas page. So. Sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, um, if, um, the link, yeah, the link is, is uh, it should be posted on the EE web page, but maybe that's not done yet. But yes, in, indeed, it should be also, <laughs> there should be a way of getting back home once you've, ventured off into the, un, into the you know, dangers of uh, the unfettered Canvas internet portal or something. So uh, other questions on logistics? <laughs> okay, so uh, here, remember last time we talked a little bit about uh, families, families of probability distributions, and we had this notion that there was this universal set of all possible probability distributions over n random variables, which we sort of uh, depicted by this strange blue shape script u, and in general when we're trying to learn, you know, like a, a probability distribution learning procedure would, for example, try to identify some point within this set, but the problem is that u, when it's so unrestricted, becomes very difficult and computationally complex and oftentimes intractable to learn over. And what we said conceptually, at least, is that a graphical model provides a formal, systematic, um, visual, but, but at the same time mathematically formal, but still visual in the sense that we can use our intuition, it, it describes all of these things, uh, these ways of, uh, you know, describing a subfamily or a subset of the family of distributions, and F, script F is that subfamily. And the idea, at least, that actually happens often is that by limiting and limiting the complexity of the family within which you're working in, you can uh, identify a member of F, which is actually better than uh, what you might find tractably 
if you had this unrestricted family, you. And you might have noticed that uh, I've thank thanks to the question I got last time, the geometry is now closer. That one, that one is closer. So thank you for that last question. Um, but in case that was confusing. So, uh, and we saw that there were these three types of graphical models. We're primarily going to be talking about um, undirected graphs, undirected graphical models today, um, and inference on trees. And then we also talked about how um, uh, that a graph by itself is not sufficient to describe the family, that you need these Markov properties or rules or some sort of way of, of going from the graph to possibly a very large set of equations which describes the set of distributions that the graph represents. And, and this is at least depicted by this letter M, which of course wants to Markov properties. And, and uh, you know, conceptually, although operationally, like, I want to make sure this is clear, this is a concept. You can conceptually think of M as a set of predicates, and it might be a very, very large set of predicates. Um, but, uh, and so, but, but in some sense, every member of the family, it must be the case that all of these predicates are true. Like each predicate might be, for example, a factorization requirement. Is it the case that this distribution factors in this particular way which is based on the graph. And of course, it's also based on the Markov property since the predicate is sort of one of the Markov properties in some sense. But in general, it's not necessarily the case that we're going to have uh, an, an incredibly inefficient way of verifying that you're a member of a family. There are going to be much more fluent and efficient ways and tractable ways of, of verifying family membership. And so we also talked about probabilistic inference. Um, these equations correspond to um, what, might wa what one might want to do when you're computing inference quantities. These ones right here. And uh, graphical model inference basically is sort of a restricted form of inference where you're saying you're developing a strategy for doing these kinds of operations, these inference operations, for any member of the family corresponding to the graph and the Markov properties. So in other words, it's not necessarily the case that you're developing an inference procedure that works universally for all members of you, but just by looking at the graph and understanding what the graph means, you can automatically, oftentimes, sometimes quite effectively, produce an algorithm automatically. You're producing an, al an algorithm automatically that will work for any member of the family. And so this is a, a huge benefit because of the amortization properties of this of this aspect of graphical models. You do it once for the graph, and you've got it for potentially an uncountably infinite number of probability distributions. So the set of predicates that you mentioned, like they are typically associated with the edges, and edges of the graph, right? Like the subset of variables are conditionally independent given uh, of some other subset conditioned right. on a particular set, and that right. can be verified using the structure of the graph typically. And those are typically the Markov properties that you mentioned. Yes, right? Con conceptually, conceptually. Right. So I mean there aren't other ways of like, you know, accepting the graph structure, are there other things that are used to specify these Markov properties? Well, in our, in our three cases, um, you know, Markov random fields and yeah. other, you know, Bayesian networks and, mar and uh, factor graphs, it will all, the predicates will be based on factorization requirements. But there may be other, I and mean, like I said, there are there's research into graphical models, like there are ancestral graphs and there are chain graphs and there are other things that have uh, more complicated semantics. And so, if you were to sort of describe it as predicates, they would be potentially more intricately described. And uh, so. even sometimes verification of a particular rule may take like super, ex like you know, not polynomial. Type yes. Of, like, like, suppose I have a max that kind of. Yeah, but that, that's why I said this is conceptually. So I think. This is not an operational definition, so it's not like th this isn't what you would do in practice. This is what you can think of as a graphical model. Like the reason why I'm doing this, by the way, I can I can tell you this is because I sometimes when people first see a graphical model, it's not clear that the graphical model represents a family. Right? The graphical model is not a distribution. The graphical model is a family, and so conceptually, you can think of it as there being a large, you know, potentially a very large set of predicates. The predicates themselves might be very difficult, but at least conceptually and mathematically, you could you know, think about verifying that all these predicates are true. And if any one of them is violated, you're out. You're out of the family. That's, that's the idea. Now, we will see instances of this where that will be a viable prospect. In fact, we will see a very simple example 
in a minute. Um, and I realize that this may not be entirely clear yet, but I think once we see start seeing examples of this. Um, so, right, so this is a sort of a summary. A graphical model consists of a graph and a set of rules of properties, often called Markov properties. Um, we have a family, a, a, which is a subset of the set of all distributions. Uh, any member of the family must respect the constraints that are specified by the graphical model. Any distribution that does not respect even one of the constraints is not a member of the family. I've said that a number of times now. Uh, the constraints in, in this class, at least, are going to take the form of factorization, which often can be shown to be equivalent to conditional independence requirements. But the example I gave last time gave an example of a set of constraints that didn't require anything to be conditionally independent of anything else. And as we will see today, factorization is useful because it allows the distributive law to be used to produce much more computationally efficient strategies for doing uh, inference. Um, and then finding uh, the best way to do inference can often be done entirely graph theoretically. So you just look at the graph and you've got an algorithm for doing inference for any member of the family. Okay, so let's see some of this stuff in action. Um, so mark of random fields. And Markov random fields is one type of graphical model in this that we're talking about in this course. And it has its origin from actually statistical physics and things like Boltzmann distributions and the Ising model and so on and so forth. Uh, these are very, very widely used in uh, image processing co and, and computer vision. Although, depending on who you talk to, uh, the last two, three years of computer vision papers have been dominated by deep neural networks. But on the other hand, I think there's still quite a bit of interest in using uh, Markov random fields for computer vision. So basically, the idea, the idea is that the graph is undirected. Okay, so there's no arrows. There's only one type of vertex. And uh, a very simple example of this would be, um, uh, say, you've got a matrix of weights. So W is a matrix of weights. Um, and many of the weights might be zero. I mean, it's typically the case, in fact, that, that a bunch of these weights are zero. And then you have um, a vector, so, so um, s of 1 through s of n. And it's a vector of binary random variables. Let's say they take on values plus 1 and minus 1. Okay. And so the vector so there, the corresponds to, the length of the vector corresponds to the number of nodes in the graph. So this would be the case that there's n vertices in the graph. And um, we define an energy function, which is it's a function of the vector s which basically sums up the weighted combinations of products of, of, the, um, of the elements of the vector. So in the uh, most general of cases, there are going to be n squared terms in that sum. Okay. And then once we've got this energy function, we define a probability distribution in this way. So we have the probability of s. Any configuration of binary random variables s has probability uh, 1 over z, and uh, it's exp of the negative energy over some temperature value. And then z is a normalizing constant, uh, which is, we will be seeing quite a bit of z in this class because z is called the partition function. And it's, it turns out that z is, is critical, or at least z is a vehicle that can be critical for doing probabilistic inference. And just by looking at z in various different ways, we can actually get an inference procedure. And that will be critical for the variational strategies we're talking about. But for equation 2.2, we just see that z is there so that it's a validly normalized probability distribution, namely that it has values between 0 and 1. And if you sum over all entries in the binary vector, and all possible values of the binary vector, we're going to get uh, that equal to 1. Okay. Now, um, it's often the case in computer vision that, that s, this vector, actually corresponds to a grid. So like we might have, um, like here would be, a nine element vector. Right, which is a, th a three by three grid. And it's maybe the edges are connected in this particular way. So, so that would mean that any edge that doesn't exist, like if this the edge, this green edge from this node to this node, does let's say that that guy doesn't exist. And so that would have a corresponding weight which is zero. Uh, the only weights of the weight matrix that are non-zero are the ones that are shown with an edge. And the reason why oftentimes they're done in a grid is because when you're looking at two-dimensional images, uh, each pixel in an image corresponds to a random variable. And let's say, for example, you're interested in, in like doing image segmentation. Uh, image segmentation is a problem where you're trying to 
label each pixel as either a foreground object like, or, or a background object. Um, and, and this is an important problem. People do this all the time in uh, computational photography and, other, and using Photoshop and, and messing around with your pictures at home. And, and so image segmentation is really important. And so mark of random fields are very, very widely used to, um, to do that because it's basically saying that the likelihood, in some sense, of a given pixel being either foreground and background is very, very directly influenced by the labels of your immediate neighbors. And in this case, your immediate neighbors correspond to these guys. You know, the, up, the, t the two guys above and below you and the two guys to the left and to the right of you. Okay. And so basically, WIJ determines the interaction style. Um, if it's the case that WIJ is zero, then there's no interaction. It's kind of like a missing edge in the, in the undirected graphical model. If WIJ is positive, then that sort of says that it's more probable it's than otherwise to have neighboring pixels have the same label. And if it's negative, it's sort of saying that neighboring pixels are anti-correlated, or, or, or it's more probable to have them be less correlated. But the thing is, it's not like, you know, all these things are interacting together in this big mesh network, and so it's not so trivial to say, for example, immediately, here's the most likely thing. Obviously, if it's, this is just the graph and all the lights are positive, then it says they should all be zero or all be one. But on the other hand, if some of the weights are neg negative and positive, it's, you know, you might change one to one, and that might be good for your right neighbor, but not good for your left neighbor. Okay. So the way this corresponds to a graphical model is kind of like what I've already said. So the matrix and vector is a graph. So V is a set of N nodes. And um, this is the key point, that this edge exists in the graph. So IJ is an edge. It's a, it's a pair of vertices. IJ is an edge. And that exists in the set of edges of the graph only when the weight, the corresponding weight, IJ, is non zero. And so we might then expect that any Ising model, think getting back to families, let's say that P is an Ising model, this guy would live in the family corresponding to that graph under the Markov random field semantics. Okay. And that, that ends up being a true statement, which we would need to prove, and we're not going to prove it now because I want to give you some examples of families first. So let's, let's see two real world, but relatively simple instantiations of, of this family concept. So um, let's take a graph, a mark of random field again. Yeah, question. I wonder, in previous case, we don't care about the, whether the weight is a 1 versus the, the weight is a 10. Well, it would, it would mean something different, right? Because it would correspond in some sense to the strength of the immediate interaction, right? So if, like, if you're a node here and your left neighbor has got a weight of 1 and your right neighbor has a weight of 10, it would probably be the case that you're going to be more penalized in terms of probability to take on the value of your right neighbor because it's only a weight of one versus your left neighbor. So, so the weights do matter. The weights change the distribution. But what thi the statement I'm trying to make sure is clear to everybody is that regardless of the weights, as long as the graph respects the zero non-zero pattern, so the graph is such that there's never an edge when there's a zero, then, regardless of the weights, that distribution, P, which is right there, is a member of this family. Now, how do you choose different members of the family? By changing the weights. As long as you don't change the zero, non-zero pattern. As long as you don't change the sparsity pattern of the matrix. But you can change the weights and you haven't left the family. So that's the claim. Right. Now, that's, some, that's a claim that is non-trivial to prove. We would need to prove that. But I'm, I'm claiming that it's true without giving a proof because we're going to prove something much simpler first. Okay. But that, that is sort of like a real world instance of a, of a Markov property. But here, um, here let's do something. Uh, first of all, let's make sure that we know what cliques are. So um, we've got a graph, and, and, it, and for right now, all of the graphs are undirected. So a, a clique in a graph is a set of vertices that are fully connected to each other. Okay, so um, we have a notation for cliques. So uh, C. C of G consists of a set of sets of vertices. Okay, each set of vertices is a clique. And so C is a set of vertices, which is a clique. It's basically just saying that 
since script C of G is a set of, set of sets of vertices, then any member of that has to be a set of vertices, and that is corresponding to a clique. So in other words, if it's the case that U and V are a member of some clique, then it must be the case that that edge exists in the graph. That's the definition of a clique. Um, so here's a graph on uh, five nodes. And so the cliques consist of, um, you know, trivially they're the singletons, since any singleton vertex is, is fully connected. I mean, it's not, you know, it's b basically means that any other vertex in the set, there's an edge. And since there are no ver other vert vertices in the set, it's, it's a clique. But then it becomes a little bit less trivial when we look at pairs. So one, two, there's an edge is one, two, and one, three is an edge, and two, three, and, and three, four, and two, four. Those are all, and two, five, those are all the edges in the graph. But there are some cases where there are bundles of variables that consist of three, um, uh, of size three. So one, two, three, like x1, x2, x3, that bundle there is a clique since anything in that set is connected to anything else in that set. And then another one would be, for example, like two, three, four. So which would be this one. That's another clique, right? So, um, but notice that there's no more cliques because let's say, let's take two, three, four. What if you're considering adding five to two, three, four? That's not a clique, why? Because X5 is not connected to X3 and X4. So it's not a clique. So uh, that, that lists all the cliques in the graph. Okay, now consider the following. So we've got a graph and its cliques are given by, um, C of G. Um, and consider um, a probability distribution that can be represented as the following. It can be represented as a product of clique potentials. So um, let's zoom in on this equation a little bit. So basically what this is saying, what is this thing? This is a, a function. The name of the function is based on C, which is the clique, and it's a function only of the variables X sub C. All right, so this, this function by itself doesn't involve, it's a factor really, it's a sort of, it's a function that doesn't involve any of the variables outside of the set C. But then what we're doing is we're taking a product over all C. And then we're normalizing it, so that's a valid probability distribution. Okay. And Z is again the same thing, it just, Z is just this potential, is the uh, partition function. Okay. Uh, now from the perspective of, of describing that the distribution can be factored as a product of clique functions, we don't really need the uh, z, because z is really uh, is a constant, right? It's just sort of sitting there. It doesn't change depending on the values of x sub v. And so what we could do is we could e equivalently write the factorization property in this way, so where z has been absorbed into some number or one of the factors. Right. If we're only interested in sort of expressing that this probability distribution can be factored according to the cliques in the graph, then equation 2.5 is all that's necessary. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Now let's look at our first real family. Okay. Um, yeah. Question. So when you when it, it's a function of all the cliques, is it only the like so you know how you have one two and then one two and then one two and three? Yep. We're going to talk about that. Okay. In this particular case, we're not saying it's only a maximal clique. We're saying there's a function that involves the singletons. There's a function that involves the, the edge pairs. And there's a function that involves the triples. And if there's any f four size four cliques, then it involves those and so on and so forth. So we're saying that here's a family of distributions. So what is this saying? It's saying it's all distributions P such that for all cliques in the graph, uh, there exists this uh, function, which is non-negative, and it's the case that that distribution can be represented as a product over all cliques. It just says that it's possible, by any distribution that it's possible to represent in this fashion is a member of the family. And if you're a distribution that cannot be represented in this fashion, then you're not a member of the family. That's, that's the rules. The question. You switch from phi to psi, is psi 
question. Oh, that's n that's not uh, that was not meant. That was not intentionally. Yeah, I switched from phi to psi. Uh, so I call this phi because phi is the original Greek pronunciation of phi, and phi is the Western European adulteration of the correct Greek pronunciation of the letter phi. And also, it's acoustically more distinguishable between phi and psi. So, and, and, I, and that way I can remember them, otherwise I get them mixed up. But anyway, psi was meant to be the same as phi. Uh, another question. And um, for the partition function, this might be jumping ahead, but if x is real value, can you sum over that? Would that turn into an integration? Yes, it would turn into an integration. And if it's a Lebesgue integration, then they're the same. And sums and integrals are mathematically identical under Lebesgue integration, but op uh, operationally, and when you actually go to implement it, they're quite different. So, um, okay, so this is one family, right? Now let's take a look at another family. Oh, sorry, let me, let, before I add this, let me ask you this question. Are the clique factors unique? Are they necessarily unique? No, there's quite a large number of different ways of representing this. In fact, Getting back to your question about max cliques versus not cliques, I could, you know, one possible expression could be that all the singletons could have value one, and they're functions and they're sitting there, but they're not really doing anything. Another possible thing is that they actually are do som doing something and they are expressing some value. Uh, but on the other hand, another possible thing is they have value one, and those single things that they're doing based on the random variables are absorbed into the larger cliques. So there's lots of lots of, uh, of ways of doing this. Okay, but here's another, here's another family, which is not based just on the cliques, but based on the maximal cliques. Maximal uh, is uh, a long form for just max cliques. So when I say max cliques, I mean maximal cliques, which is different than a maximum clique. Maximal clique is a clique that is no longer a clique with the addition of any other variable. That's what that says there. Um, so adding any node to a max clique renders that bundle of variables no longer a clique. Okay, so here we go. Here's this picture again. These are the max cliques of this graph. Uh, so for example, if we just looked at this clique, x2, x3, or sorry, x1, x3, that's not a maximal, it is a clique, right? But it's not a maximal clique because <coughs> there, is a, there exists a variable, namely x2, that can be added to it and it's still a clique. But now this is a maximal clique, x1, x2, x3, because if we add any additional variable to it, it's no longer a clique. Like for example, if we add x4, this bundle of variables is not a clique because this, ver this edge does not exist. Okay. So then these are the maximal cliques. Now here's another family, another wi with a different Markov property, right? So the Markov property is different. And the first Markov property we said is based on the cliques of the graph, which may or may not be maximal, or, or which we're saying are not necessarily maximal. Here we're only looking at the maximal cliques. Okay, so we're saying um, we're taking MC, which are the maximal clique cliques, and we're saying it's all distributions such that for all cliques in the set of maximal cliques, there exists this factor, and it can be written in this particular way. Okay. Now the question, and this is, this for some of you might be trivial, for others it might be non-trivial, and for others it might be medial trivial, but however degree of triviality it is, the kinds of questions that people might want to ask about these families are, how do the two families compare? So in this particular example, we, maybe we can do this. So we can uh, quite simply reason that, um, okay, well, the clique factorization is a subset of the max clique factorization, right? So let's, ha can, we, can we prove this without actually writing anything? I mean, it's, it's pretty clear, based on, in some sense, the discussion that we've already had, that any factor which involves a non-maximal clique can just be absorbed into a maximal clique factor. We can just define a new factor on the maximal clique which is defined to be the product of all of the you know, um, non-maximal cliques that it contains. And when there's, when there's, a, um, when there's a, a, a choice, like let's say we have this, this, and this. 
So we have two maximal cliques. We have this maximal clique, and we also have this maximal clique, right? So if we had one factor that just involved one, one of these variables, let's call this guy, say, x2. If we had one factor that just involved the variable x2, that factor could be either on the pink maximal clique or on the yellow maximal clique. That we can choose, but we, can't, we don't want to do both. Although we could do both, we could take the square root and send half of it to one and half of it the other, to, to the other, if you wanted to. As long as um, it's possible. So therefore, that proves uh, that this is a subset relationship. On the other hand, the clique factorization is the superset of the max clique factorization family. And why is that? Because any, any distribution that can be factorized in terms of its max cliques, we can just trivially define other functions based on the non-max cliques, which are just identically equal to one. So getting back to that I other example, I could just say, you know, uh, psi of x1, x2 is equal to one, just identically. And that, that's a valid factor. It's a non-negative factor. It doesn't change the distribution at all. It doesn't change the normalization. And so therefore, what we conclude is that these families are identical. So there's no difference between these families. And because any distribution that factors in terms of one can be factored in terms of the other and vice versa. Now, in general, this is not so obvious. In general, like when we start looking at more complex Markov properties, it's not so obvious to show that um, these factorization requirements are, are identical. In fact, um, in the um, undirected graphical models chapter, uh, it describes something called the alphabetical theorem, which uh, shows uh, a fairly intricate set of equivalent relationships and equivalent Markov properties for Markov random fields, which uh, is uh, sort of made identical by something called the Hammersley Clifford theorem, which requires a non negative uh, distribution. And so those proofs are, are quite non trivial. And uh, because we, we wanted to, I wanted to concentrate on uh, inference this quarter, um, we won't be going through those proofs in class, but we might be asking about them in homework. So you should read, therefore, the undirected graphical models chapter. Kay. Okay, any questions on, on this notion of? saying that families are equivalent, or not, or subset relationships amongst families. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about trees. So when we look outside our really nice window, we see uh, lots of nice trees, and they still have leaves on them. Um, our YouTube audience, unfortunately, doesn't have the luxury of turning its head, although if you're watching on YouTube and you turn your head, maybe you will also see trees. Um, but on the other hand, you might see you know, a jail cell or something, depending on where you are. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but here's some trees for you so that everybody can see trees. Um, that's exactly what our window looks like. This is just a snapshot I took of our window. Um, so a mathematical tree is, is really... Um, a particular type of graph. So uh, first of all, a graph is called a forest if it's the case that for any pair of vertices, u and v, there is um, no more than, than one distinct unique path that connects u and v. Okay? So if you're a vertex here and you're a vertex there, there can be no more than one path. There could be zero paths or there could be one path, but there can't be two paths, two distinct paths. Um, and if it's the case that you're a connected graph, like suppose you're just interested in, in say, this graph here, then, then you're a tree. Okay, so a tree can be defined as saying that for any pair of vertices, there's a distinct path, one distinct path between those two pairs of vertices. And trees, nece trees are necessarily connected. Forests are disconnected trees, or trees are connected forests. But in fact, there's a lot of different ways of defining trees that I think are kind of interesting. So. Uh, a graph is a tree if it's connected and it has no cycles, so you can't have any loops or cycles uh, in the graph. Uh, a graph is a tree if it has n minus one edges, where n, n vertices obviously, if there's n, n vertices and n minus one edges and no cycles. A graph is also a tree if it's connected and contains exactly n minus one edges. So that by itself, there being the connectivity requirement and the n minus one edges already guarantees that there are no cycles. These are all equivalent definitions of a tree. Okay. A graph is a tree if it has no cycles, 
and exactly one cycle is created if an edge is added to G. So as soon as you add an edge, you created a cycle. A graph is a tree if it's connected, and if you remove any edge, then the remaining uh, vertices, or the remaining graph is not connected. So that's also the definition of a tree. A graph is a tree if every pair of vertices is connected by a unique path. That's the one we saw on the previous page. And then lastly, a graph is a tree if it can be generated in the following way. If you can generate it in sort of in inductively, where uh, you, you choose the next vertex by taking a vertex and connecting it to one previous node. So all trees can be generated in this fashion. And this last one is really important because this corresponds to, this last definition corresponds to exactly the graphical reason why computing on trees is very, very fast. Now this doesn't make sense yet, but it will by the end of today's lecture. Is there, is there a question? Or is this just a very relaxed way of, you know, some people like sit like this. You know, they say, <laughs> what are you doing? I say, well, I'm stretching. I say, well, when you're in class and you're stretching with one arm, it looks like you're asking a question. And then they look at me like I'm asking a very strange, I'm making a very strange comment. So that has happened before. Um, honestly, it really has. Um, OK, so trees and inference. So um, in, a, in a tree, so let's, let's think about the clique property that we saw before uh, and then consider it in the context of trees. Um, So um, in a tree, all of the cliques uh, are, well, all of the maximal cliques are of size 2. And if you, take any, um, if you take any set of vertices that's larger than 2, it induces a tree. Or, uh, sorry, it induces a forest. Um, it's not it's, if it's connected, it's obviously a tree. But if you take any set of more than 2 vertices, uh, if it's sort of consecutive along the tree, then you've got a, a tree. If it's not in consecutive along the tree, then you've got a forest. Okay. Um, and moreover, if you look at the factors, if you look at the Markov random field factorization requirement that we saw, the one that we just we showed was equivalent, whether or not you use mar max, we, we sort of said, well, in the Markov random field, let's just use this Markov property F, which is called the factorization requirement in terms of either max cliques or non-max cliques, which doesn't matter because we now know that they're equivalent. But if you take any probability distribution which is a member of this family for a tree, that means that the factors have to be exactly, uh, well, the, max, the factors can't be any bigger than size 2. And this has very, very important consequences for inference. Okay. And now, why is this important for inference? We're going to explain this first in the context of a chain, which is a subset of, um, uh, of the set of trees. So a chain is basically a node, a set, of, a, a set of vertices. It's a graph that are connected in succession. So a single vertex is a chain, a pair of vertices connected is a chain, and a succession of vertices is connected is a chain. So for example, like a Markov chain, the reason why it's called a chain is because it's a chain. Um, and the reason it's called Markov is because everything's called Markov. You know, this guy, Markov. Um, he really liked factorization, Markov. Um, but anyway, a chain is a tree, but not vice versa. So um, as you can see, because this thing on the right that I just highlighted in yellow is a chain, this is no longer a chain, if I add a little branch there. Okay. So um, if it's the case that p factors with respect to a chain, then uh, the p of x is equal to the following. So they basically, we've got pairwise factors. Each one of these guys, let's zoom in a little bit on it. Um, Psi of I, j I and I plus 1. Notice that the, that the cliques are successive ver variables. We've just numbered the ver variables in order. In fact, Markov chains, uh, or hidden Markov models, the hidden part of a hidden Markov model is a Markov chain. And we usually number the numbers in successively in, quarter in the order of time or something, or position if it's a, ge if it's a genomic sequence. Um, now, suppose we want to do the following. So we, want to, we have this um, probability distribution, which, which is factors according to a chain. And we're interested in computing this marginal distribution, p of x3, x4. Okay, so what that involves is, is doing this, right? Is, doing, is summing out all of the variables except for x3 and x4, right? Now, what's the cost? What would be the cost of doing this naively? I mean, not, not using any of the properties about p, 
but just doing this naively. Equation 2.9 would cost. And, and let's just say that uh, all, all random variables are discrete and all random variables have r possible values. It would be r to the n. r to the n. r to the n, because you need to compute it for all x3 and x4. So there's, there's, another, there's another r squared. So, um, so it's very difficult. So basically, it requires r to the n operations. The reason why is because for each value of x3 and x4, we need to do, and this is where you're getting the r to the n minus 2, uh, you need to do, do this thing. So overall, doing this, computing that table, it's a two-dimensional table, computing that two-dimensional table is rn. So um, this is bad, right? This is not something we could do, even if, it w if, even if it was the case that the variables are binary, right? But on the other hand, it's very, very wasteful because it doesn't take advantage of the fact that we could use the distributive law to make the computation much, much more efficient. So very, very simply, the distributive law basically says that if you've got a bunch of values, a, b, and c, and the computation a, b plus a, a, c, which requires two multiplications and one addition, can be done by factoring out the common factor, a, and do it with one addition and one multiplication. Right, so that's a saving of one multiplication. That's really useful, right? But in, in practice, I mean, really, you, you can save, you can get an exponential speed up in, in n um, relative to what you would do if you were to do it naively. So like, for example, consider summing out over only over x of i. So here we've got this summation over all of the n variables, right? And here we have all of the factors that do not involve x of i. And here we have all of the factors that do involve x of i. And uh, we have this parenthetical expression, right? So the, there's green and tan. Right, so the green doesn't involve x of i, the tan involves x of i, and so what we can do is that one summation that involves x of i can be s distributed into, using the distributed law, into this product. And so what we're left with is something that involves summing out over everything except for x of i. And now the, the tan factor sort of became this, is that the, the sum involving x of i only involves those factors that need, that involve x of i, the sum over x of i doesn't unnecessarily involve these other things that uh, have nothing to do with x of i. Because that, from the perspective of summing over x of i, is a constant. And so why is this good? Because this actually significantly reduces the computation. So let's see this um, in action. Okay, so let's do it in the case where n is equal to 5. Okay, and so n is equal to 5, we want to compute again uh, x3, probability of x3, x4. Okay. So rather than doing it naively, the first thing we do is we send in the sum as far to the right as it can go. And there it is. We do that summation. And then once we do the summation, we rename the result to be uh, phi of 1 comma 2 x2, but where the 1 has been crossed off. And let me try to zoom in on this just in case you, you can't see that. So what we've done is we've summed out over x1 and then what we've done is renamed the result to be something that shows what has been summed out by crossing it off in the subscript and what has not yet been summed out is not crossed off by 2. Okay? And it's only a function of x2. So what, was that, what, what, is the, um, what is the cost of doing that? R squared. Right. Remember, it's this, don't forget about the value of x2. Uh, so for all values of x2, we need to do an order r, r, r summation. So to create that vector, it's a length r vector. To create that length r vector, we need to spend r squared computation. So now what we do is we just plug it back in here. We've now, now got this, this new expression. Okay. And um, now we can say that x1 you know, has been eliminated. x1 is no longer part of the computation. It's not there. Anything, the sum over x1 is gone. X1, even, even though we, we still have this 1 there, but 1 has sort of been crossed off. So it never appears in future summations. And like we said, it only costs R squared. Okay, so let's continue in this process. 
uh, if we want to compute probability of x3 and x4, we have these two other sums. We have sums over x2 and x5. What should we do uh, next? Let's, um, let's next sum over x2. So again, what we do is we take the sum over x2 in equation 2.10, and we send it in as far as possible using the distributive law, and then only sum over that bit that is required. And so here, here we, we have that factor that we computed before, right? And we have the, uh, which involves x2. There's this stuff here, which is involved too. It's an original factor. We sum over it, and then we, we have a new, a new factor, uh, which says that we've eliminated x1, we've eliminated x2, and it's still a function of x3. But to do this, to, do, to compute this thing here, how much did that cost? R squared again. So it's another R squared operation. And so what we then get is this expression. We've got one remaining thing to do, the sum over x5. Uh, but before we do that, we see that we have this new factor that uh, where both x1 and x2 have been eliminated, and it's only a function of x3. And we've only spent, again, order r squared computation so far, or 2 times r squared. Th so there's no exponential blow up yet. OK, so the next thing we, we do is, OK, well, we have to sum over x5. And we, again, reorganize using the distributive law and commutativity of arithmetic. We, we send the sum in as far as possible and factor out things that are a constant. And we do the same thing here. And we get another factor that sums out over x5. And it's another r squared prospect. And so we get the result which is that this whole thing, probability of x3, x4, is equal to this product, the product of these three tables, one, one of which is a two-dimensional table and one of which is a, and the, oth the other two of which are one-dimensional tables. So the whole thing, again, it's, it's another r, r squared step. So the, f so in, and in general, you can see doing this repeatedly. So for a length n chain, the cost of doing this is going to be order n times r squared, which is much better than r to the n. So it's not exponential in n anymore. It's, it's linear in the length of the chain. And it's quadratic in the number of random variables. So interestingly enough, and this is really critical, it's quadratic. The clique size is 2. So it's r to the 2. So that's not a coincidence. The max bounded, clique size. It's Sorry. bounded by the size of bounded by the size of the clique. If the maximum clique size was 3, yes, we will see that. That's exactly right. But in a tree, as we will see, we're getting a little bit ahead. But yes, you've got it exactly right. So that uh, the clique size in the graph tells us about the computation. But the as we'll, we'll, we'll talk exactly about this. So. Um, so we got an order r squared computation. Let's say that n is a constant. So it's an r squared computation if we eliminate the variables in the order 1, 2, 5. And there are other orders as well. I mean, there are, there's not a unique order that has the optimal computation. We could use the order 5, 1, 2. So in other words, we sum out x5 first, then we sum out x2, sorry, x1, and then we sum out x2. Or we could do order 1, 5, 2, uh, and all of, the, all of those would, I t would obtain in r squared in, in r squared, order r squared, this marginal distribution over x3 and x4. But on the other hand, not all orders will do this. So what if, for example, we were to do the following order where the first thing we do is we eliminate variable x2. Let's zoom in on this a little bit. And so the first variable we're eliminating is x2. So here's the computation. And so that's fine. We do that, and we get this resulting factor, phi. Um, and phi basically says, OK, you're a factor that involves uh, variables x1 and x3, because they haven't been eliminated yet. But you have eliminated x2, and x2 is gone. But what is the cost of doing this, of this step? R cubed. R cubed, right. So that seems like it would be a foolish first variable to sum out. And then, you know, next maybe you could sum over x1, right? And what and to get to get this factor, what would be the cost of doing that? R 
you know, r squared. And then, and then we sum out over x4, and then we get the resulting thing. Again, we get another very different looking expression for uh, the same quantity, but the whole thing ends up being r squared. So if r is very, very big, for example, this would be, this would be not a good thing to do. It would be a factor of r worse. In fact, it's unboundedly worse. It's unboundedly in the sense that it grows with r. So you can make that as bad as you want. So it seems like what's happening is that some orders, some of the elimination orders, will inextricably couple together factors, while other orders don't necessarily do that. And in general, what we'd like to do is, when we're choosing the order of the variables to sum out, choose the one that do the least inextricably inextricable coupling of the variables together. And the graph, it turns out, s will tell us how. And this is what I mean by the graph sort of, we do this for a graph and then any distribution that obeys the rules expressed by the graph is such that we can do it for any distribution. And here's the key problem, like what, what do we mean by inextricable coupling? I mean it's a mathematical problem, it basically is the following. It says that there are no functions in general in general, there's no functions g of a in h of c that can be such that when you do this summation, so let's say like f1 is a general function of a, b, and f2 is a general function of b, c. And if we do that operation by summing over the common variable b, there exists no g and a, sorry, g, g of a and h of c, which makes this expression true. So in other words, this can't happen in general. You know, it can only happen for certain f's, right? But um, what what f's and g's? It can only happen for certain f1s and f2s. So what would be what would be true for f1 and f2 to make this possible to happen? They factor, right? And if they factor, if it's the case that f1 of a b is really f1 of a times f1 of b, then we could pull out. A, f of a, and we could, and if, if the same thing was true of, of f2, we would pull out f2 of c, and then it would work. So it's sort of like a, f it, but, but the whole idea of these functions, these factors, are that they don't factor, they don't factor any further, and, and the cliques sort of express you know, where the, the lack of factorization may be. And this is true in general, so rather than just for scalar variables, here it's meant to sort of show that the same thing happens um, when you have vectors. That basically, if you have um, <coughs> one function which is a function of x of a and x of b, where a and b are sets, and another function which is a function of x of b and x of c, where again b and c are sets, as soon as we sum out all of the variables in b, we've inextricably coupled together a x of a and x of c. Yep. I have a question based on uh, the last slide where, uh, so what I was wondering is, wouldn't, wouldn't it be best to always uh, pick for the first uh, summation a uh, node that is connected to only one other node? Yes, that's exactly right. When that happens, so we will, need to, so we will talk about that, but that's exactly right. So I should I should mention I mean I'm getting questions that are that indicate that you are understanding this which makes me feel very good. If you're finding this uh, overly simple, uh, what I usually say at this juncture is that there will be plenty of opportunity to be thoroughly confused later in the course. So feel happy that you're understanding this now because this won't last. <laughs> Sorry, no, that's that's not. You should never say that. I didn't I didn't mean so. Th hopefully it will last and you will continue to ask questions that correspond to a slide that I have in later in the lecture. Um, but yes, that, that is correct. So then it's, a, it's an important point. Are there any qu other questions? Okay. Okay, so what does this sort of mean from the perspective of a graph? So whenever we have, whenever we say that there is this factor, F1, that involves variables A and B, then that sort of suggests that in order for the graph to allow a distribution which involves that factor, the corresponding 
vertex-induced subgraph, namely the graph involving just the nodes A and B, should be a clique. Because when everything's a clique, it basically says, oh, when A and B, when all of the nodes A and B are a clique, it says, okay, I'm allowing there to be a factor that involves th those variables in the clique. It could, be, it could be part of a larger clique that involves more than just A and B, but it has to at least be A and B together, union together. And then similarly, and this is just saying the same thing, uh, this would suggest that B and C is a clique. But on the other hand, after you sum out the common variables B, what you're sort of saying is that now f of xA and xC don't, doesn't decompose anymore, doesn't factor anymore. So that means that after the operation of doing summation, what would be the equivalent graphical step to that mathematical process of summing out x sub b. That would mean that you need to add edges so that the resulting set of variables a and c correspond to a clique. If it's not already. Maybe it is already. So that means that there is this notion, this graph theoretical notion of elimination equivalent or sort of uh, you know similar to this notion of eliminating variables by summing them we can eliminate a variable so we can eliminate a variable in a graph v what we do is the first thing we do is we connect all of the variables all of the neighbors of v together so that v and its neighbors form a, a clique now and then we eliminate we get rid of v and all of its incident edges Uh, I think I should, yeah, I should use the word incident as the official word. Incident. It's incident edges. So I will, we will see examples of this. Don't worry. So once it's the case that a V has been so eliminated, then basically means that you know, V is gone, right? And V's incident edges are gone. But all of its former neighbors now constitute a clique. Yep. By removing a node and edges, we are changing the graph itself. We are changing the graph itself. And does that mean that a family which was satisfying some given Markov properties for the original graph will still satisfy, will still be a part of the newer graph and Markov property family? That's a really good question, and yes, it does mean that. But And we will have a theorem to prove that in a minute. So you're also anticipating future slides. Very good. So yes, and that's critical, right? Because if it was the case that by changing the graph, we've now said, oh, uh-oh, we've lost the family. It has to be the case by changing the graph, we increase the family. Okay. And this is actually something that when people first learn about graphical models, they're surprised about. Like, you might spend, you might do structure learning, say, or something. You might find this nice structure which exactly respects your scientific domain. And, it, and you're really happy because it's really, really sparse. And you're saying, look at how sparse my graph is. It's going to be really, really efficient. But then when you go to start computing with it, you, you start adding all these edges in and, and just because you have to if you're doing exact inference. And then you get back a graph which corresponds to a larger family. And all this work that you spent making your graph sparse to begin with is not being exploited from the perspective of doing probabilistic inference. And so this does actually have implications from the perspective of scientific modeling, which is that if you don't pay attention to what's computationally doable, then you might be doing extra work unnecessarily. So there are other reasons, however, for doing that. So I mean, there's, also, there's uh, issues associated with the parameters. If this, if this like for example, it, it might be the case that the sparsity gives you a very, very low parameter representation of a particular problem domain. And maybe that there's a, there's a data sparseness, training data sparseness reason for doing that as well. But in general, com from computational perspectives alone, you're going to see that sometimes the sparseness graph doesn't give you any benefit. And we will see that in a little bit. So what, what, what's, what's happening is that whenever we do this elimination, we're getting new, variable, new edges in the graph. So new edges in the graph, and these are going to be called fill-in edges. And F is going to be, these are edges that aren't in the original graph and that are only added through the process of variable elimination. Okay. 
So here's an example. Um, this is an example where zooming is absolutely necessary <laughs> to see what's going on here. So, um, so it's just a chain, right? And so it's a chain, and we're, we're saying that it factorizes, and so we have these factors psi, psi 1, 2, psi 2, 3, psi 3, 4, and psi 4, 5. And, and the, the factors are associated with the edges, which are the max cliques in, in this chain. So one strategy for elimination would be to do this. But if we start from this chain and eliminate x1, so eliminating x1 would basically be doing this, sum doing this summation here, which then when we send in the sum as far as possible into the products, we get that, which then gets us um, the result. And notice that the result is um, a graph that only involves four variables where x1 is gone. But since we were eliminating a variable x1, you know, its neighbors, when we eliminated x1, so here's x1 again down here, right? What, who was its neighbors? So it only has one neighbor, x2, right? So since we eliminated x1, its, its neighbor is already a clique. It's one variable. And so there's no additional fill-in edges that are added. And so when we reconstitute the graph, which is a word that some might associate with orange juice, but here we're using them in the context of graphs, when we reconstitute this graph, we get the same thing, which is really nice, right? Because we haven't added any additional edges. On the other hand, let's look at eliminating x4 first. Okay. So here's, here's the original graph. Let's see if we can get this all on the same page. Great. So we eliminate x4 first, which is, which is right this guy. So when we eliminate x4, we... Um, uh, Let's do this mathematically and also graphically. So when we eliminate x4, so here's the, here's the thing that corresponds to summing out the variable x4. Okay? Um, we send in the sum over x4 in as far as possible. Right? And then here's the computation, this thing here. And this is this r cubed step. Right? So we've got an r cubed step. x4 is not optimal. And what we're left with is, is this new factor over x3 and x5. And the new factor then... Um, um, can only be represented by a graph that has an edge directly between x3 and x5, since x4 has been eliminated. And so we add this new edge here. Right? And so now we re and then when we reconstitute the graph, we've got something that is a, is a larger family, right? Because we now have this X, x3 and x4 are no longer a max clique, and x4, x5 is no longer a max clique. The, the max clique involving those three variables is x3, x4, x5. So that means that that graph can hold a larger class of probability distributions. And also, it means that uh, because we've eliminated things in the suboptimal order, we've are, we are spending um, more compute. Now this was a case, unlike what I just said a little bit while, while ago in terms of, uh, in response to this question, this is a case where we're unnecessarily elevating or increasing the size of the family we're working in, right? By adding that edge between x3 and x5, the family has grown to allow factors that involve a three clique, a, a size three clique. But if we eliminate it in the right order by say eliminating x1 first and eliminating in the chain order, we haven't elevated the family. So this is, an, uh, this is an instance where there's unnecessary elevation of the family. But there are other cases, as we will see, where there's necessary elevation of the family. Are there any questions about this? Because it's really critical that you can think of elimination as a process of summing out a variable from a bunch of products of factors, on the one hand. And there's a, an identical notion of eliminating variables in a graph, which involves adding fill-in edges um, to the neighbors. And so this edge here, again, that edge, that's the fill-in edge that we added. So, so F would consist of one edge, which is X3, X5. Th and there's a question. Yeah. Yeah, so when you, re like, so when you, the point of the, the doing that, pulling the sum in was to efficiently calculate the sum. Yes. Probability. Yes. So when you remake the graph again, that's right. But what I'm claiming is that when we do this elimination process, 
and then we reconstitute the graph. The computational properties of this particular elimination order is identical to what it would be if we started with the reconstituted graph. So like, let's say that we, this red graph on the bottom right, that's a graph that inherently is going to involve an R cubed step. Because it can, from the perspective of that graph, if we want to, fr from this red graph, if we want to have a computational strategy that works for all members of that family, that means that there's going to be members, there's going to be members that have a factor that involves those three variables, x3, x, I, I, I have to hold, I'm becoming farsighted, x3, x4, x5, um, and so therefore we have to do that. So if we, if we were to eliminate x4 first, starting from the original chain graph, that would be foolishly advance or increase the family to the case when the family allows for those cliques, those larger cliques, or those larger factors. But in this case, since it's a chain we're starting from, it's unnecessary. But the point is that when we do reconstitute the graph, that reconstituted graph is really the family that we're working in when we're doing that particular elimination order. If we use the first elimination order, the thing on the left, this guy right here, we haven't <coughs> increased the family. You know, and sometimes it's good. You know, we, we're going to talk about this in a minute. So here's another example. Here's a couple of other examples. So here's here's an original graph. It's a very. I mean, this is this is kind of a trivial example. So if we eliminate x3, we're just we're just talking about the left hand side here. So if we eliminate x3, which is this guy, then we get this graph, which is just this. It's just x1, x4, and when we reconstitute it, we get the same one. Okay. Here's another one. If we eliminate, it's, it's a four cycle, right? So it's, it's four variables in a cycle. There's no, there's no variable that when we eliminate doesn't have two unconnected neighbors, right? So no matter what variable we eliminate first, let's just do it x3. So we eliminate x3. That's necessarily going to add this edge. So in, after we've eliminated it, we've got this graph, right? And then when we reconstitute it, we're here. So that graph corresponds to a larger family. That graph involves cliques of size three, whereas the original graph we started from at the bottom involved only cliques of size two. So this is an example of what I was saying, that if we, um, if we, if we like, let's say we do a scientific study and we decide that this is the perfect graph and we also are very happy because we think it's computationally good to have this four cycle for some reason. And then we start doing elimination and it's necessarily going to couple together at least one edge. Then this, this family here is really the family we're working in, or at least computationally. So we might as well, at least computationally, from computational perspectives, we might as well have started from that green family, from the bigger family, since there's no benefit computationally from starting from the smaller family. Here's another example, a really bad example. So let's start with this. Th these are not trees anymore, by the way. So I mean, there's, there's no, and there may, there may not always be an optimal, or so there may not always be a no that when you eliminate it leads to no fill-in. So here's an example where we're going to eliminate x5 first. Okay? So x5 has got quite a large number of um, of neighbors that are unconnected. And so we're going to have to add a bunch of additional neighbors, or a bunch of, I'm sorry, a bunch of edges. And that's going to include this one, and I think this one, and maybe this one, and this one. Right, so there's all these neighbors that need to be added. So we've got this newer graph, and then when we reconstitute the graph, we've got this much more complicated graph, which is a bigger family. Okay. So um, let me just, I'm, I'm going to skip the first, the left two examples and just do the right example. The, I'm going to skip the left and the middle example since they're kind of the same. Although, actually, maybe I shouldn't skip this one. So, so here, if we eliminate, if we start from this graph here and we eliminate x4, that's going to create this edge here. And so we, we get this guy and then the reconstituted family is here. So we've started from a family that involves... Um, it started from the family up here that involved only cliques of size two, but we are unnecessarily elevated the family to involve this clique of size three. On the right-hand side, um, let's eliminate this guy first. OK, 
Okay, so are all of his neighbors a clique? Yeah, so all of his neighbors are a clique. So then when we eliminate it, down in this example, no new edges. And so when we reconstitute it, we haven't elevated the family. So that's, a, that's good. So there are cases, even when it's not a tree, when you can eliminate a variable without um, necessarily adding edges. But notice that if we had done this all with equations, we would, have, we would have had these really long and relatively complicated equations. But when we're doing this visually and graphically, we, since we have a graphical notion of the steps required to do the elimination of the original set of factors in an equation, we can actually reason about this perhaps much more intuitively and efficiently and just think of it as a graphical operation. Um, So the key connection between the mathematical operations uh, of doing elimination and the graphical operation of doing graph elimination is that those variables that are inextricably coupled together after the computational elimination of a variable via the summation process are exactly those variables that are connected together by edges after the graphical process of elimination. And those newly coupled variables can only be represented by a single factor and similarly they have to correspond to a clique. And also critically, when you do this coupling, the computation is r to the size of a union c plus 1. So that basically means that the computation is exponential in the size of the clique. So that basically means that the sets a and c are the neighbors of the node B that gets eliminated at that particular time. So we're sort of interested then in elimination orders that either have neighbors that are already coupled together or already connected together in a graph, in, in a clique, or alternatively, which I think was already suggested, which we can do in the chain case certainly, and as we will see in the tree case, which uh, is, is the case that there's only one neighbor. And so doing this incorrectly can change the cost. And since we're dealing with an exponent, there can be exponential differences in costs in the size of the cliques. Okay, so then the goal is to find um, a vertex, V, to eliminate that either has only one neighbor, which is good because we can, or no neighbors is also fine. So no neighbors means that that's an independent random variable, right? If it has one neighbor, that's fine because, it, because no coupling is done. Or it could be the case that we only have neighbors that are uh, already connected, so they don't add any, any new edges. And if it's the case that we can't find a node that satisfies these two goals, we must accept that there is some fill-in. And so this corresponds to the case of, of a necessary uh, increase of the family. For those cases, like in the case of the four cycle, remember no matter which variable we eliminated first, we necessarily had to add an edge. There's no way of doing the marginalization without in adding an edge. There's, there's, sort of, there's necessary filling. And so the, the thing I've already mentioned is that computationally, we might as well have had those additional edges in the graph to begin with. And when it's the case that the fill-in is non-empty, it's kind of like we're solving a problem for the more general family. So rather than solving it for this family, we're solving it for this larger family, where g is equal to the graph on the same vertex set, but additional edges, e union f. Does that make sense? I, I wonder whether this uh, more general family are strictly kind of uh, general, or it, it is possible in one situation, where even I add one edge, well, let me ask you that question. So you've got a marker of random field. Let's just talk about marker of random fields for now. So, um, so an edge basically means that there can be a factor involving exactly interaction between those variables. I, if you have a factor involving an interaction exactly between those two variables, you're not a member of the family when that edge doesn't exist. Because right? there can be no factor that involves those two variables directly 
where there's, when there's a missing edge. But as soon as you've added that factor, you're now saying, I'm, I'm allowing there also to be factors that involve those two variables directly in a factor. So every time you add an edge to a marker random field, you are increasing the family, necessarily, just by looking at the clique factorization property. Um, Yeah, I think, um, so this, this theorem is answering it non-strictly, right? But this also allows F to be empty. <laughs> so the reason why it's non-strict is that F could be the empty set. And if you add the empty set, obviously you're not increasing the, the family. But if it's the case that F is not empty, then this inequality um, is strict. And the proof is kind of like, we've already, you know, we've already done it. So if we start with any distribution P, to, to show that a family is bigger, we need to take a distribution from the smaller family and show it's a member in the larger family. So if we take any distribution P, and then P factors with respect to the cliques in G. Okay, so now G sub F only has additional edges. So if you're a clique in G, meaning you're fully connected, adding edges doesn't suddenly render you not a clique, right? Adding edges can only mean that there might be other cliques, but any given clique in G is also a clique in G sub F. It's not necessarily a max clique, but it's certainly a clique, right? And so any clique factor in G is preserved in G sub F. And so therefore, the family can only grow. So adding edges increases the family. So then getting back to Chandrasekhar's question, is that you know we are free, I mean, at least from the perspective of family membership requirements. We are free to add edges into our family and we haven't lost any members. If you keep adding edges to the graph, the family's only gonna get bigger. There's nobody who's gonna be excluded. What, what happens is that if you start removing edges, then you, then you reduce the family. This is, removing edges in the graph is actually critical for approximate inference procedures. Like oftentimes you say, I've got this distribution, it's a member of this family, but this family is too computationally complex. I'm gonna remove some edges intelligently and solve it, solve a projection of this distribution down to the smaller family, the closest projection, and solve it there. And hopefully that's good enough. But for doing exact inference, which is what we're going to be talking about for the first bit of this class, um, we can only elevate the family. And sometimes we have to elevate the family. So in the chain case, we saw that there's always an order. I mean, if we or eliminate in the order of the chain, either left to right or right to left, we always can find an order where, um, where the... Uh, fill-in is empty. But on the other hand, we saw that a, a foolish order could um, give us an R-cubed computation. Now chains, we can clearly see, are such that there's always an obvious perfect elimination order. Perfect elimination order is one that doesn't involve any fill-in. This is a, an official term, a perfect elimination order. We start with always one end of the trees. Now the question, uh, one end of the chain. Now the question is, is there always a perfect elimination order for trees? Yes. yes. Who says yes? Who says no? Who says I don't know? Okay, we will see. We need to, we need to prove that. This is, this is non-trivial. So here's a tree on the left. Right, that's a tree. And Let's say we wish, like we saw before, to compute p of x3, x4, but in this particular case, on this tree. If we eliminate starting with x1, so here's, here's the resulting computation. We eliminate, and we have this very, very um, big factor that involves x2, x5, x7, and x9. Um, and of course, one has been crossed off, so but what has happened is that the fill-in, the required fill-in, is we, you know, we've coupled all these variables together. And so here's the resulting graph, the resulting reconstituted graph. So if we were to eliminate x1 first, it would be a very poor decision. We'd suddenly go from maybe what you can see as being an r-squared computation in the tree to being an r to the fifth computation. So this would be a really poor example poor variable to eliminate first. 
But on the other hand, if we eliminate in this full order of 6, 5, 9, 8, 7, 1, 2, <laughs> so uh, that's obvious, right? 6, 5, 9, 8, 7, 1, 2, and we're left with x4, x3, that each time we do that elimination, it's always the case that we're not coupling any, any variables. That doesn't mean that when we, notice that when we've eliminated x1, all of its other neighbors, except for x2, had vanished. Perished, if you will. They're gone. They've been eliminated. They've been removed from consideration. Um, with this order, 6, 5, 9, 8, 7, 1, 2, um, <coughs> each step requires r squared. And each node at each point in the elimination process either mathematically, so each, each in, the, in the mathematical case, we are involving an R squared computation, but in the graphical case, each node at that point of elimination has only one neighbor. Even if it isn't the case in the original graph, it has only one neighbor. It's like by the time we get to that node, it has one neighbor. So a leaf node, or sometimes called a pendant node, or sometimes called a simplicial node, is uh, in a tree a node that only has one neighbor. So that's called a leaf. So eliminating leaf nodes is good, and trees always have them. So in a chain, in a ch if we have a connected chain, we always have two leaf nodes, one on the left and one on the right. And then we eliminate one, we still have two leaf nodes. We are, we're never, if, as long as we don't eliminate, well, as long as we don't eliminate any of the non-leaf nodes, if we eliminate along the chain, we go left or right or alternate between left and right, that's fine. We've always got leaf nodes, and that's good, a good thing. Um, but a tree, on the other hand, also always has at least two leaf nodes. Okay, so why, why is this the case? So um, let's prove it inductively. So let's start off with n is equal to two. So if you have a tree of two nodes, it has two leaf nodes, right? Both of those are leaf nodes. Now let's assume that it's true for n minus one nodes. So any tree with n minus one nodes has got at least two leaf nodes. So why is it true that a tree with n nodes has two leaf nodes? Well. Suppose it's the case that, um, that uh, a tree doesn't have one leaf node. Okay, so, so, so clearly a tree must have at least one leaf node. And why it m must it have at least one leaf node? Because if it doesn't have one leaf node, that means that every node in the tree um, has got two neighbors and we can create a cycle. So like imagine marching along the tree, we get to a cycle, we get to another node along at one edge, and either the node has that edge, the other edge has been touched already, in which case we found a cycle. Otherwise, we can keep going in the tree, and keep going along. And eventually, we get around back to where we started, um, in which case we've got a cycle. And so, therefore, every tree has at least one leaf node. Now, the question is, why does it have um, uh, two leaf nodes? So we take we take that one leaf node and remove it, and we're left with a tree of size that, that's of size n minus one. Right, which by induction has two leaf nodes. So then when we add back in that leaf node, we've, we've not reduced the number of leaf nodes from the n minus one tree. Right. So does that make sense? So, so we, we have that extra leaf node we added back in. If it's, if it's a leaf node connected to a leaf node, we still have that, a new leaf node. The one leaf node from the n minus one tree has been gone, but we now we have the new leaf node plus the other leaf node from the n minus one tree. Done. So therefore, trees have always two leaf nodes. This is a tree on the left that has quite a few leaf nodes. It's rich in leaves, right? We like trees with lots of leaves, like for example, the ones out our window right now. Although soon they will have no leaves, right? It's still, it's still summer here in Seattle. Um, so this should suggest a strategy for doing elimination on trees, right? We find a leaf node and eliminate it. And since now we've got a tree of, of size n minus 1, we've got another tree which also has two leaf nodes. We find another leaf node and eliminate it. And we just keep doing that. Um, now let's, um, I, guess, uh, I guess this is a good time to take a break because now we're in this uh, tree inference section. But let me now uh, ask you if there are any questions about trees. So if you have or you're looking at the marginal for uh, two nodes that are both at the leaves of the chain graph or 
Tree, then you don't have the. Then you'd have to be R cubed, right? Then you have to be. I'm sorry. R cubed if the marginals you're looking for are both at the end of the chain graph. It very much depends on the marginals. That's a very good question. Yes. Now, if if you're interested in that marginal, now, the, from the perspective of machine learning, and this is a little bit of a subtle point, um, but when you're trying to learn using any of the strategies that we talked about for learning last time, like generative learning or discriminative learning or max margin learning and most other learning strategies, you don't need anything other than the marginals associated with the cliques. So you don't need those marginals uh, for learning. But on the other hand, it's not such a rosy picture when one is a scientist wanting to use a graphical model because if, let's say, you're a scientist, which you probably are, and you've developed this beautiful tree graphical model for your domain, which might be geophysics or something. And now, from a scientific perspective, you say, okay, I know that these things are indirectly related through this tree. But on the other hand, I want to see, like, if I vary this variable, how does it affect this one? Because I, I want to sort of get rid of all of the inter intermediary, intervening influence stuff to see how these guys are directly correlated. So I, as soon as I do that, then uh, yes. So from a scientific modeling perspective, certain marginals are more expensive than others. But from a machine learning perspective, you never need to do that. So, but very good question. Yeah. So in some case, like, maybe it's worse just the with the graph that with those nodes connected. Like, from a computational perspective, if you were a scientist and you needed that marginal, yes, you could just start from that guy already connected. But, you know, the thing is, Again, from a scientific modeling perspective, you're saying that these guys aren't directly influencing each other. I mean, this gets into sort of like, what would it mean to make these things directly connected? It would mean that there could be a factor that just involves those two things. But if you're trying to, to model the true domain, like the, let's say you're, you're, you're trying to model a causal, causal process. This influences this, which influences this, which influences this, and then now you're trying to do marketing or something. And you, now you want to see how, if I vary one variable, how does it influence the other variable? You don't care about if it, its causal relationship, you care about its correlative relationship. Starting from that original, from that family where they're directly related would be sort of scientifically wrong, <coughs> even though computationally it's identical. So it's a different set of goals. So we use diff graphical models for different perspectives, one from the perspective of causal and scientific modeling, another from the perspective of developing computational strategies. So this class is primarily geared towards the computational aspects of graphical models. There's a great course that I always tell people about by Thomas Richardson in the statistics department, and he talks a lot about causal modeling, and it's a, it's a very different perspective, but very important perspective from a scientific per modeling perspective. So, Okay, let's take a break and uh, come back in a minute. Okay, so the next topic we're going to talk about, now that we know what trees are, and we know, we sort of have this idea of elimination, is how do you do, how do, you do influence on trees? Now, what I think is surprising about this topic is, is that we're going to discuss inference on trees, but once we have a thorough understanding of inference on trees, we're going to realize that um, we've also understood how to do exact inference on any graph. Um, which, which is a little bit surprising. Uh, so if you're thinking along the, along the way, which you might very well, because so far you all have been asking very good questions, if you are thinking, well, why do I only care about trees? Trees are not ubiquitous. But it turns out that the, the, this stuff that we're learning about is exactly what you're doing, but just on a transformed graph, um, even if it's the case that you're starting from a non-tree graph. And we will talk about that. Not today, but today we're going to talk about trees. And we're obviously not going to finish uh, this tree inference section. But let's start off with um, looking again at um, elimination and the idea of message passing. So raise your hand if you know everybody has a reason for being here. And you've probably heard about graphical models. You want to learn about graphical models. And maybe one of the things that you often hear uh, talked about in graphical models oftentimes in the same sentence or at least paragraph is the idea of message passing and then graphical model inference corresponds to message passing. So raise your hand if you've heard of message passing before. Okay, raise your hand if you, you know what message passing is. Okay, so in a few minutes you will know exactly, you will all know what message passing is because it turns out that message passing really corresponds to a form of elimination. So you all know, in fact, in some sense what, what message passing is because now you know what elimination is. 
So how is, how is that so? Um, so let's start with this tree on the left. There's a tree. And the goal is to produce this marginal p of x1 and x2. And so we're just going to re redraw the tree. We're just redrawing the tree. We're not doing anything. Remember, there's, it's, it's, there's this whole science to how best to draw graphs in, in planes. Uh, there, there are, and sometimes the graphs are, are non-trivially, obviously identical. Uh, I'm sorry, not obviously identical. But anyway, all we're doing is we're redrawing it and we're sort of rooting it. We're doing a funny thing. We're sort of rooting the graph at an edge, uh, which is in this case x1 and x2. And then these arrows, these blue arrows, let's zoom in a little bit on this, on the right side. These blue arrows correspond to the uh, message passing steps, or, or sorry, that correspond to the elimination steps that are necessary to, to do the partial computation necessary to get this marginal at edge one, two. So namely, we first, like maybe would send this guy, and then maybe we'd send this one, and then this one, and then this one, and this one, and this one. And we keep, we keep doing these eliminations. And because each time we do an elimination, we're always eliminating a leaf node at the current graph. We're not coupling any edges, and we're doing this inference on trees optimally. Now, these elimination steps can actually be seen as messages. We're sending a message from one node to another node, and another node to another node. Um, so here's, here's the exact computation using the notation we saw before. And I'm not sure how well you can see this, but basically the first thing we do is, um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but we have this factor between um, ver vertices 8 and 14, and we sum out x14, and we get this, ver this factor which involves only x8. And there's no fill-in. So next we have this factor between edge, uh, or for edge 7 and 3, we sum out x7, and we get this factor that only involves um, x3. Then we, then we sum out x8, and we use this factor, which involves x8, plus this new factor, which we computed up here, uh, sum out x8, and we get this new factor that involves only x3. And we keep going through this. Here's another factor, which involves only x3. And then we like sum out the factors. These are all the factors that involve x3. This looks like it's a really long computation, but we've got this factor, which is a one-dimensional table. This is a one-dimensional table. This is a one-dimensional table. And this is a two-dimensional table, which when we do that summation is still an R-squared computational thing, right? I mean, obviously, there's the multiplications of these different tables, but those are considered constants. Um, and so then we have this new thing, which involves a lot of history. Right, that history of we we've crossed out, we've eliminated seven, we've eliminated fourteen, eight, nine, three, and not yet one. So we're sort of keeping track of this whole history when we're doing this elimination. Okay, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through all of this, but let's expand this. Um, we're going to look at seven, eight, and nine into three. So we're going to look at this little bit of graph. Seven. 8 and 9 into 3. So that little section there, we're just going to take out of context and rotate it horizontally. Okay. And we're going to look at these elimination steps. Like this elimination step here can be seen as, in some sense, a message going from 7 to 3. This elimination step here where we're summing out x8 can be seen as a message from here to here. Now notice in this elimination step, let's zoom in a little bit on that. In that tan elimination step, we're using the message that we, we already received going into x8. So there is a message that was already received into x8. And we're not implicitly, we're not explicitly saying that, but it's there in the, in the elimination, right? And then the other elimination step is this. Which corresponds to a message between nine and three. Now, I should mention that the idea of a message is really a metaphor of the process of elimination in this in this uh, context. So, like, what is really a message? A message is sort of a communication of some information from one point to another point. So, why is this a valid metaphor? Because, in some sense, the information that we're communicating from one point to another point is the way in which these two variables interrelate along an edge, 
And by marginalizing them out, we're communicating the way in which these two variables interrelate to a one-dimensional table which sort of talks about the marginal way that these, these variables, that the one variable at the receiving side of the message exists. So we're communicating a pairwise relationship to a, a one-dimensional relationship. And so in some sense, that is, that is how it's a message. Um, um, what else do we have to say here? I think we said everything. So then, okay, the one last thing actually, we, which we want to say. Like once we've actually received, <coughs> once X3 has received messages from all its other neighbors, we can send this message, which is this really long computation, to X1. Maybe I should use a different color here. We can, receive, we can send this message. Okay. So notice that we've done the pink, the tan, and the red messages first. Or maybe I should say cyan or whatever color that is. And, and, now, and then once we've done those three messages, then the green message becomes valid. We can't really send the green message. We can't do that elimination step first. We need to have first received this information from these other neighbors. And that notion is critical of an ordering of the message. This corresponds to how we've done the ordering of the elimination. And here's, in some sense, the idea. Each node receives a message from its children in a rooted tree. We've rooted the tree at this edge. Remember that edge that we've rooted the tree at? So as soon as we root a tree, then there's a directionality associated with the edges. It doesn't mean it's a Bayesian network. It just means that we're, we're a node and we can point towards the root in a tree because there's only one path since it's a tree and we can point towards the leaves uh, or unless you're a leaf yourself. So each time uh, when we send a message, we receive a message from our children, the ones that are in the direction away from the root. And once we've received a message from all, all the children, then we can send a message to our parent, the one that's closer to the root. Again, make sure that this isn't meant to ascribe any Bayesian network semantics to this. We're just talking about the particular root. If we change the root, it would be a completely different parent-child relationship. So we're still talking about marker random fields, in other words. So a message, a node I may send a message to its parent J when I has received a message from all of its children. And at that point, going back to the idea of elimination, all of its children are gone. They've been eliminated. That's a horrible thought. Right? And then you send a message to your parent, and then you're eliminated. That's a horrible thought. And then eventually your parents get eliminated. That's also a horrible thought. So this is really horrible stuff we're talking about here um, from the perspective of familial relationships. But if you're not interested in anthrop anthropomorphizing any of these graphs, then you're, you're in good shape, and you don't have these horrible thoughts. So especially things like parents being chosen arbitrarily. God, this really sounds awful. If this was a sociology class, then this would be really, really bad. Evil sociology. Um, so the parent is chosen arbitrarily. It depends on the root. So who your parent is depends on the root. Um, but the pattern is true. It just changes, you know, the, the ordering, the valid ordering. And in particular, this restriction, this is really, this thing really is valid. But it changes, you know, the, the, the parent-child relationship changes depending on who the root is. And who the root is depends on what marginal you care about. And so this sort of introduces this idea of a protocol, that there's a protocol that if you follow in a tree guarantees that if you send messages that abide by this protocol, you will be doing a valid elimination order. And not only valid, but you also will be doing a computationally optimal elimination order. And so the protocol says the following. A message may be sent from a node I to a neighbor node J only when node I re has received message from all of its other neighbors besides J. It's MPP, message passing protocol. So notationally, what does this mean? So let's say that I arrow to J corresponds to a message being sent from I to J. So remember, this basically means that we eliminate the variable xi under the assumption that something else has happened before it potentially. So that message can occur from i to j. Then the protocol can be written as the following. So this message 
can occur only when, let's say that delta of i consists of all the neighbors. So let me just, so let's say if this is i here, and then i is connected to a bunch of other guys, like, so then delta i would be all this stuff in orange. Okay. So delta i is the neighbors. So basically then the message protocol says that you may send, the message passing protocol says, you may send a message from i to j once it's, a, it's the case that for all of your other neighbors, namely delta of i except for j, you've received this message. This message has occurred, k through k to i. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about trees, yes. Um, but as we will see, we, this, we will be able to do a transformation of any graph into a structure which this still applies. But right now, we're just talking about trees. Like, like I said at the beginning, I said we're talking about trees now, but the, mech the stuff we're learning now is going to be applicable to any graph. If it has a circle, then it will just stop. Does it, does it become multi-propagation, really propagation, when there's, when there's an circle cycle? Uh, okay, so... The, so the question is, there's two questions, if it's a cycle or it, and loopy loopy loop application. So right now we're just talking about defining what a message is and we're talking about the context of trees. But yes, you're right. And it, if, if there's a cycle, we can't start. If it's just a cycle, then there is no, there's no way to start here because there is no way to receive, there's a, there's a circularity. And, and one way to do it is to do loopy, loopy belief propagation. And loopy belief propagation, as we will see, is a form of approximate inference procedure, which corresponds to a variational strategy, as we will see. But um, what, um, what we're talking about right now is just trees. And what we're going to be able to, what we're also going to see is that even if a graph is not a tree, it can be transformed into a tree where this holds. But this is not approximate inference. This is exact inference, meaning that you get the exact marginal quantity as opposed to some approximation. Now, this, this doesn't scale because, as you will see, that it, there are some cases where the exact marginal quantity is exponentially difficult to get. So this won't scale. But still, we need to learn about exact inference be before we start doing approximate inference. OK? Well, th those, are, those are very good questions. But I think we're, we're out of time. So um, that is the class. I will see you on Monday. Do the reading. <laughs>